our next guest, uh, well, he needs very little introduction, of course, to you. He's a former US Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, uh, a terrific journalist as well, by the way, specialising in, well, everything, economics, geopolitical affairs and more besides. You can read him daily at paulcraigroberts.org. That's paulcraigroberts.org. It's uh, a great pleasure to welcome back to our show the man himself, Paul Craig Roberts. Paul, thanks for giving us your time today. I, I really appreciate it. Well, Rich, it's always a pleasure to be on your show. Well, thanks for doing it, because I know a lot of people are after you today and looking to get a, a comment from you. I'll tell you what I'm going to do, Paul. I've had a lot to say on this. I spent 25 minutes in the programme's monologue playing audio and talking about what's been going on. And I wrote about it, as you've been writing about it, and you're a real writer, it must be said, on your own website today. I'm going to shut up, Paul, and let you take over. What have you made of what's been going on since last weekend? The alleged chemical attack, the tweets from the President Trump, the French President saying today that he believes there's proof that Assad was behind it, and the UK government meeting today to decide on a course of action. Over to you, Paul. What what, what have you made of all of this? <laughs> Well, the so-called skirpal poisoning and the so-called uh, Assad use of chemical weapons, these are orchestrations by the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, we know that for a fact because if they were not orchestrations by the U.S. and the U.K., it would be the U.S. and the U.K. who would be demanding the investigations, not blocking the investigations. And it would be the Russians who were blocking the investigations and not demanding them. And we can see that the script was already written in both cases and that the purpose was to launch this flotilla of missile ships and an aircraft carrier to attack sites in Syria despite Russian warnings. So what we are witnessing, Richie, is the most reckless and irres irresponsible act of starting a war ever. Because the Russians have made it clear that they will respond to such an attack. And yet it's moving forward on the basis of total orchestrations. Moreover, even if both things were true, that the Russians did poison Skirpal and did give Assad uh, permission to use chemical weapons, these are not justifications for start starting a war which could very easily be World War III and end life for all of us. So what we are witnessing, and we also see the, the May government, if that's what it is, I mean, is it really a government? No. We see that this idiot prime minister is refusing to allow parliament a vote on whether she can take the British to war, the consequences of which are unknown. No doubt the Americans gave her that order because Cameron was unable to deliver on his promise to support the Obama regime's attack on Syria when the parliament voted it down. So this time parliament is not to be given a choice and England or Britain will be taken to war based on American orders to its lapdog, Theresa May. This doesn't show England to be a democracy or that the people have any say in their future. So I don't really see how anyone in England or Britain can stand for that. Um, but they are. And as far as the idiot president of France statement that he has proof, how would he have this proof? No one has the proof. Why does it show it to us? What is it? If the proof existed, it would be given out to justify the lie. There's no proof. Why does he say he has proof? Because no one 
in the Washington governments for the last 20 or 30 years, the British, the French have told the truth about anything. Remember Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction. Remember Tony Blair's intentional conscious lies to the British cabinet and the British people to justify Britain's cover up of the American war crime of attacking Iran on the basis of a total lie. Remember the Malaysian airliner that was shot down. We still don't have the investigation, only accusations that Russia did it, but never did we get the results. No proof, no investigation, just leaks, just accusations. Wherever you look, this is the pattern. In my view, let's see, it's 10 days before this, uh, flotilla of missile ships arrives at Syria. So we've got 10 days before the end of the world. You really believe that, Paul? I do. Because you've written extensively about it in the last couple of days, and I recommend our listeners check out paulcraigroberts.org and two articles, well, all Paul's articles, but two in particular over the last couple of days. You believe it's that serious now? Well, where are the protests from European governments? There are no protesters in the streets of European cities, of American cities. Congress, the U.S. Congress has not reminded Donald Trump that he has been given no authority by Congress to launch a military attack on a sovereign country that is likely to ignite a war, possibly World War III. The moronic American prostitutes are egging it on. What are the possible outcomes? You, you want to discuss? Let, you want me to discuss the possible outcomes of this? Let's discuss the possible outcomes. Just before you do that, let me just make a couple of things clear. While I don't disagree with what Paul has said about the UK. We haven't had official word yet that May would ignore Parliament and take autonomous action against Syria. But that's not to contradict Paul, because I think it's likely that's what she's going to do. But on the Trump and Jim Mattis, um, defense, of course, the US Defence Secretary, Paul, Trump's tone seems to be a bit more measured today than it was yesterday. And his Defence Secretary has basically not been as you know, bullish or, or or threatening in terms of the language he's used. Is there any hope there? Well, one of, that's one of the possible outcomes. There are two hopeful ones. And one of them is that the United States Joint Chiefs of Staff has concluded that in the event of a Russian response to an American attack on Syria, the entire flotilla would be lost, the carrier included. And this would inflict a humiliating defeat on U.S. arms. And that in view of this possible outcome, the Joint Chiefs recommend against the announced attack. This possibly has occurred and it would be an explanation of why Trump's latest tweets suggest that doubts might have entered his mind. That's entirely possible. And it would be a, a correct analysis. Uh, we know that the Russians have missiles against which uh, no American or British ship have any protection whatsoever. And that the whole flotilla could be sunk in a few minutes. Sitting ducks, basically. They're sitting ducks. And uh, the American military uh, has to know that. And so if you consider that the Russians might mean what they said, do you want to send those ships to launch miss missiles when they're going to be sunk? 
And then you're faced with a massive humiliation. And then what do you do? Oh, you're going to have a nuclear war. Uh -huh. And I think the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they're not as crazed as some in the past, and they probably don't want, <laughs> don't want that prospect. Uh, since, again, the Russian weapons are so powerful that um, there's really no survivability. So that could be that could be the case. On the other hand, if the Joint Chiefs are afraid to show opposition because it will mean maybe they don't get all of the perks that come from being a retired three and four star general. They don't get put on the boards of the defense industries. They don't get to be Pentagon consultants. All of the sorts of rewards generals get for being lackeys. They may not want to lose those. Um, and so they may not express their doubts. But it's true that these latest tweets, on the other hand, they could just be to play to Putin's hope that common sense will prevail. While, while, while in the background, they're planning on doing something of a surprise, right? Okay. Right, yeah. right. But you see, you, you put... Putin keeps talking about, I hope common sense will prevail. I don't know why he hopes that, because there's no sign of any kind. If it was any common sense, the flotilla wouldn't be on its way. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't have left port. So, but if they're playing on that to keep him off guard so the Russians are less prepared or, or can't act quickly because they weren't prepared... Uh, that's another interpretation of the tweets. We can't be entirely hopeful about the tweets. Let me ask you a question. I speculated a couple of weeks ago when, and that's all I do is speculate, and I'm wrong as much as I'm right, maybe more than I'm right. But when John Bolton was announced as the new National Security Advisor, I speculated that they were preparing for war. And it's not a... A journalistic term to be using. It's not very professional for any presenter to use the type of language that I'm going to use now, but I'm going to use it anyway. Bolton is, is a maniac. I, I would imagine that Bolton is gen, genuinely psychotic. He's not putting it on. And when you see him, in the last couple of days, there's been a number of pictures of Trump at work, and Bolton has been sitting to his immediate left. When I saw Bolton, Paul, I thought, well, here we go. There's war coming. What about Bolton? What, what, how did Bolton find his way into Trump's entourage? I don't know. He is the most dangerous warmonger of all of the warmongering neoconservatives. Um, I don't know if you saw recently where the former head of the organization, you know, that uh, inspects uh, alleged chemical weapons use, uh, I don't know if you saw his public statement that when he was head of the organization, he was summoned by John Bolton and told that he had 24 hours to resign. And he said, well, why should I resign? I'm chosen by all these countries to be the head. And Bolton said, we know where your children are. We know where your wife is. You've got 24 hours to resign. I didn't know that, Paul. It's posted on my site. I didn't see and, that. I was on your site today, but I didn't see that. I, I'll have to check that well, out. It'll be under the guest uh, contributions, most likely, where I reproduce the man's public statements. Yeah. <laughs> so that Bolton is one of these guys who do what we say immediately or we'll bomb you into the Stone Age. And we'll kill your family by the sounds of it. Well, that's, yeah, but uh, you I'll kill your whole country. Yeah. Just your family. You, we'll bomb you into the stone in your country. Yeah, but threatening the inspector. I mean, it, what an incredible thing to threaten the inspector. You know, get out of the job or you won't have any children to go home to. I mean, this is an absolute madman. And there it's, he is. Right, right. So how did he get there? I think because Trump is 
essentially under the thumb of Israel, and Bolton is their man, and they very much want Israel, very much wants to use the American military to destroy Syria and Iran because these are the two countries that supply the Lebanon militia Hezbollah. And it's Hezbollah that has twice driven the occupying Israeli army out of southern Lebanon. And the Israelis will not risk another confrontation with that militia because it has so badly damaged their military reputation. So they have concluded they will use the idiot Americans to uh, destroy the two countries and thereby cut off the militia from any outside support or supplies or financing. And then Israel can occupy southern Lebanon, which they have been trying to do for a long time. They want the water resources and it's part of uh, greater Israel, the greater expansion of Israel. So I would imagine the Bolton got the job because the Israel lobby put him there. And he has dual citizenship, we must remember. He's a Jew. I don't, he does. I don't know if he does or not. I don't even know if he's Jewish, but he is certainly uh, a, a, a neoconservative and the most dangerous because he has... Uh, no uh, reasoning capability to understand the consequences of his actions. You're right. He he isn't Jewish, of course. You're absolutely right. But he does hold dual U.S.-Israeli citizenship. I, I've just been doing a bit of research there on a number of... Really? Yeah. I wonder, yeah. How does non-Jew get citizenship in Israel? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I will treble check that uh, later on. And if it's um, wrong, I will be the first to, to say that. But it looks like um, it looks like he does. A uh, journalist called Dan Eden did some work on finding out which of the, you know, the historic neocons and the warmongers had dual Israeli US citizenship. And he's one of them. Yeah, well, it's incredible. Let me just uh, remind our listeners. Um, Paul Craig Roberts is our guest today. Paul, of course, is the former U.S. Assistant Secretary of the Treasury. Um, great writer, of course, um, historically great writer, multiple publications. And we're talking about news that the U.K. cabinet, well, we're talking about a lot of things, but the U.K. cabinet has met, is meeting today and is due, I suppose, at some stage this evening to come out of that war cabinet, as it's been described, and either announce this evening or tomorrow that either there will be some ultimatum issue to the Syrian government or that they plan to discuss action and uh, practical action with the French and with the United States. It's good to have Paul on talking about this. Paul Craig, Roberts.org, the article there. You talked about the media, Paul. You know, one of the sad things is after the Chilcot report came out a couple of years ago and obviously highlighted the lies of Tony Blair that, that you spoke about a short time ago. We got a few very senior journalists who are still writing and working in the UK press wrote articles to say they were very sorry about their own conduct in the run-up to the Iraq war. They accepted responsibility for not challenging the nonsense, the dodgy dossier, for challenging the ludicrous claim that Saddam could hit the UK in 45 minutes. They apologised for it. And the Guardian editorial, the Guardian newspaper, basically swore a blood oath to the UK uh, citizenship that it wouldn't do that again. But Paul, I've been reading the UK newspapers for no, all the time, obviously for work, but the last few days I've read everything. There's no dissenting voice. Every editorial, every opinion piece, every guest contribution, Paul, is saying that gassing children can't be accepted. We've got to do something. It's exactly the same now as it was in 2002 and early 2003, isn't it? Right, right. of course it is, yes. And so, so the public at large, if they're not reading paulcraigroberts.org and if they're not listening to independent content creators or radio programmes, it's hard to blame them. They don't have a clue. They're told that this guy's a madman and he's killing all these children whenever he feels like it. You know, you would, 
you would, um, not knowing any better, you would say as a reasonable person, well, get rid of him. This is the tragedy. It's, it, I don't know what to do about that. What can we do about it? But it's, it's extraordinary. There is some interesting news coming in, though, Paul. I'll just share this with you. Um, Julian Lewis is a, a Conservative Member of Parliament, and he actually has a very prestigious uh, chair. He chairs the Commons Defence Select Committee. But interestingly enough, Paul, he's been saying all day, all day to different television stations, and he's been saying in the last few minutes that we should not be launching any airstrikes against Syria whatsoever. Now, to be fair to Julian Lewis, Paul, he doesn't have a clue about who and what is really responsible for the situation in Syria. But at least he doesn't want to join in the carnage. And he said today that if, if Assad is indeed a monster, and he believes that he is, if he's a monster, well, it's just as bad the other side, these Islamists that we've been funding and supporting are just as bad or worse than Assad. So we basically should stay out of it. That's refreshing, Paul. Even though he's ultimately wrong, he's saying we, we funded this opposition. They're crazy jihadists. We shouldn't have anything to do with it. What do you make of that? Well, it's a bit of common sense that Putin keeps looking for. Um, I don't know if enough members of the British government have common sense. Um, and I don't know whether uh, Putin will come to an incorrect conclusion based on this one man uh, that, oh, well, common sense will prevail. We won't have to do anything. I don't think there is any common sense in the West. Um, if there was, there wouldn't be a flotilla. Now, what you said about the uh, May government and the decision not being made, and here in the United States, uh, for some days, it's been reported that May has already made the commitment to right. join and has already sent uh, submarines and things like that. Now, this may just be part of the disinformation that is prevalent in the American media uh, to uh, uh, show the American people that something has to be wrong when our allies are supporting us. And it means that what we're saying about Assad is right because Britain is sending ships and the French are sending whatever. And uh, so it could just be part of the lies that are told to Americans to make them believe that uh, uh, Trump is uh, right in, in threatening the Syrians despite the Russian warnings. Uh, I, I'm not really uh, very hopeful um, um, it's, as we said, the Joint Chiefs may have nixed this by stating that they can't support it. Um, but it looks to me like um, it's kind of in the works. If it wasn't intended, then what was the purpose of the alleged Skirpal poison? Yeah, yeah. What's the purpose of the alleged... Uh, uh, Assad use of chemical weapons. Uh, these are such uh, transparent, obvious orchestrations that um, uh, it, it seems to be part of a script that they intend to follow out. And if it doesn't meet more opposition than it has met so far, I think they will go ahead with it. I can't really imagine John Bolton caring what uh, the the British uh, chair of that committee yeah, said. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, this is a serious situation that we are intentionally bring about a conflict between two nuclear powers. This is unprecedented. We haven't even talked about China, Paul. Can, 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 we, can I just ask you one off-the-wall question before we talk about the other nuclear powers in the world? It occurred to me today, and then I noticed other people were tweeting about this. Now, this is kind of semi-serious, so feel free to dismiss this. But the Trump tweets 
the really strong, aggressive, crazy tweets, followed by the more thoughtful tweets. I wonder, could Trump be moving the markets by doing that? I said I'd put this to you because nobody, I've never spoken with anybody who knows more about economics than you. But I wonder, are there people connected to Trump? Would they be making money on Trump's crazy tweets followed by Trump's more measured tweets? It's just a thought, Paul, and it's not really relevant. Or maybe it is. I just thought I'd throw it out there. What do you think? Well, I suspect that they are, yeah. But I doubt that's the reason he's making them. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Uh, Yeah, I I mean, we do know that these various things move the markets. Um, And... um, so, yes, I, I suspect they are, but I think that, um, you know, it was, it was, as we've discussed before, Reggie, it was the American left wing that moved Trump into the clutches of the military security complex uh, because they so hated him that they joined in uh, with the Russia gate. Uh, uh, bullshit and all the rest and uh, forced Trump into the hands of those who could defend him, the military security complex and the Israel lobby. So that I think um, is um, the reason that um, Trump has become a militarist because that gets them off his back and gives him their protection. Now, let's talk about the fact that we've got a conflict conflict brewing in about 10 days. According to reports, it'll be about 10 days before this flotilla pulls up there to Syria to begin the attack. Now, there's, we said, there's no protests. There's Nowhere. No demonstrations. The, the media is egging it on. And so how do we explain this willingness to provoke a war with a powerful military, nuclear power? And what would be the consequences? I, I can run through a few quickly. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. Yeah. One is that the Russians... Uh, trapped in the their deluded belief that facts and evidence still matter to the West and that common sense will uh, prevail, simply accept the attacks and don't respond. Now, we would all say, oh, what a relief. But actually, this is the most dangerous of all possible outcomes because it will encourage more attacks on Russia until Russia is backed into a corner and has no alternative except to deploy nuclear weapons. So if the Russians accept this by encouraging more attacks, they'll be backed into a corner and will have to either surrender or strike So that's why it's the most dangerous. The second most dangerous is that uh, the Russians, thinking that they have to prove themselves to be in the right, uh, accepts the attack and whatever it's damaged before they respond. Now, this outcome is almost as bad as the first one because this lets the war start Whereas there are a couple of other options that would have some possibility of preventing a U.S.-Russian confrontation by forcing common sense on the Americans. Let me show you what those two are. One is that Russia takes the initiative in this brewing conflict and escorts the U.S. missile ship, the USS Donald Cook, out of attack range of Syria before the attack flotilla arrives. And then Russia declares a perimeter line in the ocean beyond which the Western flotilla becomes target for attack. 
Now, this would force a showdown between Trump's warmonger government and the U.S. Congress. The Congress should say, hey, wait just a minute. We didn't authorize you to take us to war. What are you doing? That could stop it. But it would take Russian initiative. They just escort the Donald Cook away before the other ships get there and then just put a line. Don't come any further. We will regard this as a hostile act. So then the Congress has to get off its butt and say, hey, this is, uh, you know, to go to war is our decision, particularly if it involves Russia. It ain't yours. Paul, we've got some breaking news. Sorry to interject there. But they've just come out of that meeting at Downing Street and Sky News in London is reporting, and I'll read this, Downing Street has just released a readout from this afternoon's Cabinet meeting. It says, this afternoon Cabinet met and received an update on the attack against innocent civilians in Douma, Syria on Saturday. The Prime Minister said it was a shocking and barbaric act which had killed up to 75 people, including children, in the most appalling and inhumane way. The cabinet agreed that the Assad regime has a track record of the use of chemical weapons, and it is highly likely that the regime is responsible for Saturday's attack. The Prime Minister said it was a further example of the erosion of international law in relation to the use of chemical weapons, which is deeply concerning to us all. And here's the kicker. I quote again from this statement, following a discussion in which every member present made a contribution, Cabinet agreed it was vital that the use of chemical weapons did not go unchallenged. Cabinet agreed on the need to take action to alleviate humanitarian distress and to deter the further use of chemical weapons by the Assad regime. And finally, the statement reads, Cabinet agreed the Prime Minister should continue to work with allies in the United States and France to coordinate an international response. But that's the breaking news. Uh, On this Thursday, it's just after 8pm UK time, five minutes past eight in the evening. It's uh, five minutes past three Eastern time in the US. The UK cabinet agrees on the need to take action over Syria. Your thoughts, Paul? Well, not surprised. That was, that was already known. And so this is not any breaking news. This is old news. We've known that for a week here. So I think on the whole that they don't define what this action is. So maybe they're getting weaselly. In other words, I didn't hear any sign about a military attack on Syria or on 70 sites or British ships. So maybe decisive action is some kind of sanctions or censoring or Uh, You know, it sounded a bit weak, actually. Um, So maybe there's, you know, they're giving cover, but maybe they're backing off. Maybe it's like uh, Trump's tweets. Maybe the word's gone out. Maybe um, Trump told them, hey, the Joint Chiefs won't back me. And maybe, you know, there wasn't a very definitive statement. There was a lot of just language. They didn't say we're sending the submarines. No. that's right. Missile ships. And so, you know, it could be that, um, you know, the, the notion that you're going to send these ships there and when the Russians can, it will destroy them instantly. It's almost, you got to be insane militarily. And the American Joint Chiefs, they're corrupt. They want all the perks from, from being whores for the government. But they don't like to suffer, uh, you know, just complete, total military defeat, humiliation. So I think that they have some incentive to block this to the extent that they can. And I think if they tell the president they can't support it, it has to make him wonder about whatever Bolton is telling him. And I saw, too, that the American Secretary of, of Defense, Mattis, has said today that they have no proof uh, that these chemical that this chemical attack occurred. That that there's no proof. So that is also a backing off by the Secretary of Defense. So it also kind of indicates that maybe the Joint Chiefs are putting up resistance. 
to an attack that can make the U.S. and the U.K. look like paper tigers. I mean, uh, they would never recover the humiliating loss uh, of the flotilla. And uh, I think uh, when Europe, the rest of Europe saw this, it would be exiting NATO. Uh, so these kinds of considerations are broader than uh, the propaganda attack on, on Syria in behalf of Israel. So it, it may be, uh, but let, let me, let's get back to the real subject. Um, you know, we talked about how uh, if the Russians would just escort that single missile ship away, there's nothing the ship could do, it'd have to comply, um, and then draw a line. And now, now, any flotilla approaching the line, this is uh, launching a war. And so the Congress would have to intervene. And that would certainly delay and most likely stop the attack. Uh, another thing the Russians could do that would be even more forceful, but certainly in my view, it's some risk to it, but it, it's better than them doing nothing because the risk of that are greater. Uh, the consequences of that are greater, I mean. The other thing the Russians could do is that uh, they could escort the Donald Cook missile ship away from the scene and simultaneously wipe out the military capabilities of Saudi Arabia and Israel. This would remove Washington's ground-based allies and preclude any attack on Syria. And it would load the odds in Russia's favor if the United States went forward with the attack. It would also make it perfectly clear that Russia is going to preempt attack, not respond to one. China couldn't stay out of this ball, could it, if this happened, this scenario? China would have well, to get involved. No, I think China can stay out of this. Uh, they can't stay out of World War III. Yeah. Uh, they know that uh, uh, if Russia goes, they go. They, they can't survive alone. And uh, so uh, they don't have to get involved in a regional uh, conflict. But if it turns into a war, between the U.S. and Russia, uh, China can't afford for Russia to lose because if the neocons can knock off Russia, they can easily knock off China. They can't knock the two off together. So uh, the Chinese are very cautious and won't take any risk. Uh, but when they see there's no alternative, then they would certainly be be in it with with Russia, aligned with Russia. This so is the I, what I'm pointing out to you is that uh, Russian passivity in the face of an attack is far more dangerous and far more likely to lead to a nuclear war than if Russia becomes, um, instead of uh, reactive, becomes preemptive. And I've showed you the two ways that I think Russia could preempt the attack and prevent the conflict from uh, beginning between the United States and Russia. And um, whether or not the Russians um, are prepared to do that or whether they will once again trust in common sense, despite the proven track record that there is no common sense in the West. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. If the tone keeps changing, it uh, will be an indication that the Joint Chiefs may have withdrawn support. And that would be a good thing. Uh, that, that would be, that's the most hopeful. Um, you know, there's, a, there's another hopeful outcome. I don't know if I mentioned it. Uh, I can't remember. But uh, suppose senior German politicians inform Merkel, who's very weak now, uh, that Britain and France 
support of the U.S. strike on Syria could commit NATO to war with Russia. And that Germany has had one devastating experience with the Russian military and does not need another. Yeah. And they could pressure Merkel to withdraw Germany from NATO. And so the resulting consternation and confusion would likely halt the U.S. attack on Syria and Russia. So, you know, that could happen too. I mean, Well, the Germans did make a, st a statement today that they wouldn't be getting involved in any action against Syria. Now, you could make the argument, there are historic reasons for that, of course, and people will make that argument, but they, that statement was definitely made today. And of course, you're touching on something important, that an escalation of the scale that, that, that is possible is going to result in countries like Germany and Denmark and others, we could talk about Italy, of course, in the south, um, Greece, they would be right in the firing line. And I mean, you're talking about the possibility of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people being uh, being killed. We're nearly uh, out of time. I just want to re remind our listeners, w w we've got Paul Craig Roberts on the line, um, friend of ours, great friend of the programmes. Check out paulcraigroberts.org, bookmark Paul's website because he's writing about these articles in a way that no other journalist um, is writing about them. He's, a, of course, former U.S. Assistant Secretary of the Treasury and a distinguished journalist. Paul, um, you, you have a very good track record of predicting what will happen. And I kind of know what you're going to say because I've been reading your articles. But in the couple of minutes that we have left, where are we going to be in three weeks' time, Paul? Oh, in three weeks? Three uh, weeks well. to a month. Well, we will uh, either be dead or this um, thing will have uh, been stopped. So, so even if, but look, even if we, we get a hopeful outcome and this whole attack doesn't take place, we're still left with a dangerous situation that there are some elements in the U.S. and U.K. governments that were able to orchestrate two events the alleged scurple poisoning and the alleged Assad chemical attack, and use these events to leverage unsupported accusations against Russia and Syria as justification for an illegal military attack on a sovereign country. That such an outrageous orchestration as possible proves that there is no democracy or constraint on government in the U.S. and the U.K. Essentially, you've got some kind of executive dictatorships. Fascism. That has to be faced regardless of whether the Joint Chiefs stop this or, where, or whether it gets so close that the Germans do something, withdraw. You see, Germany can say they're not part of it, but they are because NATO is involved if France and Britain are part of it. So the participation of the idiot government in France and the idiot government in London commits all of the European NATO countries, whether they are directly involved or not. And if this gets close to the wire, if, if it doesn't, if it doesn't stop either the Joint Chiefs or this whole orchestrated thing blows up in their face or some preemptive Russian action like I described, it doesn't stop this. Uh, and it gets close. The closer it gets, you don't know what the Germans are going to do. They may say, look, this is too much. We're out of NATO. We're not any responsibility for this. And that would stop it. So it's not entirely without hope. But if you look at the ease with which this was orchestrated, as dangerous as the consequences could be, it has to be scary. Well, it's fascism when you factor in the media behavior. Because when you have media collusion on the scale that we're seeing it, you have to use that term. It's the absolute dictionary definition of the term fascist. This is fascism. You have these people doing these things, putting 
the lives of millions of people at risk and the media is not holding them to account. It's it's basically, as you said, Paul, egging them on, acting as cheerleaders. And all you have left is an independent media, which is under constant attack with all of these stories about fake news and all this rubbish. You know, freedom of speech is under attack as it never has been before. Um, in the 30 seconds left, I'll, I'll give you the final word, Paul. I will recommend again, if our listeners haven't checked out paulcraigroberts.org before, and I'm sure many of them have, check it out, folks. Again, it's a type of journalism that maybe if we had that sort of journalism in the Guardian, in the Independent, in the New York Times, maybe we wouldn't be having these conversations. And by the way, I have put it to Paul in the past, and not just people, not just Paul, but friends of Paul's that come on this programme, people like Philip Giraldi and Ray McGovern and others, who never get a look in when Fox, CNN and C-SPAN are looking for a talking head to talk about this stuff. The fact that a former US Assistant Secretary of the Treasury would not be invited on to give his opinion is an indictment of where the media is. Final 30 seconds to you, Paul. And again, sincere thanks for giving us your uh, valuable time today. Look, uh, Richie, we've talked before. The uh, Western media, the American one, the British one, the European one, they are nothing but megaphones for the CIA. You have to remember that German newspaper editor who wrote that book and said, there's not a single significant journalist in Europe that's not on the CIA payroll. The same is true in the United States. They are not a media. They are a propaganda ministry. They do not go against the false lies that are told. They help the agenda that is being forced down countries' throats. There is no media. It's a propaganda ministry. We'll speak again in about a month with your permission. I'll be in touch. I'll be reading you anyway on a daily basis as I do and I share your articles all the time. Um, and with your permission, I'm going to start putting some of your articles on my website with direct links back to your website, Paul, with your permission. Well, of course you have permission. <clears throat> well, I'd appreciate that. We, there won't be any gain in it for, for me other than my readers of my website care. will go straight to you. I can get gain out of it. No Not at all. No, there, there will be links back to your website, to the original article. But um, listen, thanks for doing it, Paul. I know today a lot of okay. um, independent media want to get your um, thoughts. Thanks for your time and uh, for, your, um, uh, for your interest and for your efforts. I really appreciate it. Look after yourself and we'll talk again real soon. I look forward to it, Richie, and I appreciate what you do.